a matter of introduction, um, I would like to welcome you to this first webinar uh, from the Cyber Center for Education and Innovation out of the National Cryptologic Museum here at Fort Meade, Maryland, right outside of the National Security Agency. I, I welcome you to this, this first uh, opportunity to, to, uh, to, to talk about teachers in this field on how to teach cybersecurity. And this is a very important topic, and, and it will be one of, of many, hopefully. Uh, we have a great uh, panel of, of folks to talk with you. We've got Dr. Lois uh, Palin, uh, Dr. Brandy Sato, I hope I pronounced that right, and, and Ms. Uh, Nora Blasco, who are, as you can see on the slide, are, are folks who are teaching and have actively participated in the Gen Cyber uh, Teach the Teachers uh, sessions that were held at University of Maryland Global Campus. Uh, so I, they're the experts, not me, in this, in this particular topic. Uh, so with no further ado, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Palin, and she can provide some uh, other introductions if she wish, and let me know when to switch the slides. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, good afternoon or morning, wherever you might be in the world. Um, I'm glad that you're here to uh, chat with us about how to better serve our K-12 environment from a cybersecurity standpoint. So um, as Mark mentioned, I have Dr. Brandy Chateau with me. She is the, and I'm not sure if this is still the right title, Brandy, but let me know if it's not, the acting chair of the Masters in Arts in Teaching Program. Is that um, technically, yes, I am still the acting chair. I'm also the, the program director for our educational technology programs. Great. I knew, I knew there was more stuff. <laughs> and I also have Ms. Uh, Nora Blasco with us. She is a wonderful teacher at Great Mills High School. She's a coach of the Cyber Patriots team, and she's a, on the programming teams um, with Girls Who Code Club. So did I leave out anything, Nora? Oh, it's okay. There's too many to list. <laughs> As a teacher, you seem to find yourself um, involved in quite a bit, but those are the major things. Well, I have um, Brandy and Nora with me today because they were very instrumental in the uh, 2019 Gen Cyber program that we held at UMGC last um, summer. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute, but they were um, my partners in crime in putting together a very uh, nice Gen, Gen Cyber teacher program. Next slide. So basically today we wanted to try to answer some key questions. Um, what's the cybersecurity reality? Oh, of course, there's a lot of discussion about um, supply and demand for the cybersecurity workforce. We want to uh, kind of touch on some of the voids that Gen Cyber type programs fill. And um, of course, with um, my key speakers here, we can talk about some of the cybersecurity challenges for the K-12 community. And, and that, is, that is in getting cybersecurity curriculum and content into that arena. And then how we can kind of prepare our courses and our students in the curricula for a win-win uh, a proposition. So I'll just talk a little bit about the reality. I think everybody knows this already, that um, there's a lack of education in cybersecurity in general. People are really not aware of, of what's going on in the cybersecurity arena, both from a technical standpoint and from a non-technical standpoint. People use technology, but they don't really have a good feel for what the cybersecurity issues are. And of course, in many organizations, top leadership lack cybersecurity awareness. I was at a, um, a seminar yesterday. We had a very good speaker telling us, uh, he was from, um, he was giving us a presentation on, you know, how a bill passes, 101. And um, he was talking about how when someone is in front of Congress or giving um, information to our legislature, that most of them are very unaware of what the cybersecurity issues are. And that's, that's an issue. And I think we find that in government and we also find that in private industry and elsewhere where top leadership really does not totally understand the gravity of cybersecurity and what we need to be doing about it. We talk a lot about the shortage of cybersecurity professionals and I have a, a supply and demand chart that I'll talk a little bit more about that. And 
Nora and many other other teachers know that children and students and parents even still lack di digital literacy and are not appropriately using some of the social media and other uh, technologies that are available to them. And uh, as I keep mentioning over and over again, and you hear quite a bit about, is that the cybersecurity workforce needs are not being met. Okay, next slide. I'm not going to go over this chart a, a lot. It's um, a very uh, nice chart as a heat map that CyberSeq um, puts together. And I selected the um, state of Maryland to just kind of take a look at what some of the cybersecurity job openings are, uh, the total war workforce in Maryland, cybersecurity workforce, and to kind of show just briefly how there's um, there's a high need for cybersecurity professionals in, in the Maryland area. And uh, it's very interesting to, if you want to do some research, take another look at some of the other states and, and how things are progressing in the nation as far as cybersecurity supply and demand for the workforce. And we will see that some of the numbers that people are throwing out, like 300,000 jobs, cybersecurity jobs, are going unfilled currently we can see where those um, jobs are falling. How do, how do we meet some of these issues and meet some of these um, problems? And NSA and NSF does a very good job with offering something that they call a Gen Cyber Program. Now, there are lots and lots of opportunities for various scholarships and grants, and I'm just picking this one because um, it's a very uh, interesting way that the government is helping the K-12 community and building its cybersecurity knowledge and workforce. So the Gen Cyber program in general, as I mentioned, is uh, awarded by NSA, and it, it's to hold camps to increase the interest of cybersecurity and to teach cybersecurity first principles, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the types of camps they offer are for K through 12 students, or K through 12 teachers, or you can have a combination of camps. The camp durations are from one to two weeks. They can be residential and non-residential. Um, you can just imagine how a residential K through 12 student camp might be and the, and the opportunities and the challenges that that would present. But they, you can select either one. And the computer background of the attendees is really not required because the camp is here to give the uh, participants everything they need and to provide all of the, everything that they need at no cost to participants. So um, Brandy, do you want to talk a little bit about our, the UMGC Gen, Gen Cyber Camp? Sure. Um, so UMGC held the first um, teacher camp in the state of Maryland uh, last summer in the month of July. And our goals were really to help high school teachers provide students with a basic understanding of cybersecurity um, so that they could understand how cybersecurity impacts their lives and, and all of the things that we do. It was designed really to promote best practices in cybersecurity pedagogy across content areas. So we had all secondary teachers, but they were from a variety of different areas, which actually you can see listed there in the next bullet. We had computer science teachers. We had um, teachers that taught like network technology, homeland security. We had business teachers, library and science. We even had a librarian um, and we had some math teachers. So we wanted to really kind of help them figure out how they could um, apply cybersecurity concepts to their curriculum and, and tie those principles into what they're teaching. And our goal was also to both provide lesson plans that they could in, use to infuse cybersecurity principles, but also to give them the tools they needed to create their own um, lesson plans. And so, as I mentioned, we had 25 highly qualified high school teachers from various different disciplines. There was an application process where they had to complete an application and submit 
answers to some questions as, long, as well as a letter of recommendation. So all really highly motivated, highly qualified teachers. Um, and some of the outcomes of our camp um, we tried to provide the teachers with a plethora of lesson plans and some games that they could use with students to reinforce cybersecurity first principles. We had cyber labs that they actually completed, like um, password cracking. Um, they did some things with Raspberry Pis, so there were a number of labs. We tried to give them some curriculum, um, so I was there to to support the instructional side um, as a former classroom teacher um, and professor. And, um, but we also had various uh, individuals from the cyber department contributing to the camps who could really um, do a nice job of, of explaining the cybersecurity concepts. Um, and then we just tried to provide them with supporting tools and technology. So every tool that they used in the camp, we made sure that that they had on, on the laptops that were provided. When we did the labs with the Raspberry Pis, they had Raspberry Pis and they were able to take those with them. Um, so we really tried to make the camp kind of all encompassing. Thanks, Brandy. Um, before I, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the uh, actual curriculum that we had um, because it's important to know the top types of topics and things that need to be taught. But I wanted Nora, Nora was a participant in the camp, as I mentioned, and the value that she brings to this conversation is, is twofold in that she can talk a little bit about the camp. And, but I think more importantly, as we get further in the slides and talk about some of the action items, I'd like to hear Nora talk a little bit more about how easy or how difficult it is to incorporate these things into into the classroom. But now, Nora, if you had something that you wanted to say about the camp in general? Well, one of the greatest advantages uh, to having the camp is to kind of be immersed for a whole week, especially, you know, during the summer, because during the school year, it is so difficult when you already have things to do for the classes that you're teaching. But kind of like a, a sabbatical of sorts, and like, we're only going to talk about cybersecurity and just you know, being able to think about it and have the time to plan and to think. Also, the fact that there were 25 of us there and um, just bouncing ideas off of each other, um, that everybody had different ways that they were gonna take this information back and implement it. And yet also, at the same time, everybody came with um, different experiences and different resources. So just any time that you get teachers together, I think, that's just some of the, the best type of professional development I ever go to. I mean, in addition to, of course, what's being presented, but just um, being able to talk to others as well. I personally um, really wanted to go to the Gen Cyber Camp because um, our school district was going to start a full year cybersecurity class for our high school kids. And I was pretty much the only one in the school district that was working on it and trying to figure out, well, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna put into place? So having this week, you know, with um, all the information was presented, it was a great takeaway for me to look at, you know, here's what I've already looked at, here's what's gonna work, here's what I can incorporate. And um, as Lois mentioned, I could probably add a couple of um, experiences and examples later on when she talk, starts talking a little bit more detail about what we did. Great, thanks, Nora. Mm -hmm. and, and we could probably spend uh, another hour discussing the, um, the challenges of pulling together teachers with different backgrounds, different technical backgrounds, different disciplines, um, but and the and the value of doing that and the benefits that came out of that. But uh, Nora touched on that and it was very important. Okay, next slide. So this one kind of goes. The next few slides go into detail a bit about what um, the goals of the Gen Cyber Camp. I think we kind of talked about that. We want to increase the interest in cybersecurity careers, uh, bring some diversity to the cyber workforce, workforce in the nation. We want to get students to know how to uh, be safe online and to how to and how to be good digital citizens. Uh, and we want it to basically with this teaching camp, improve the teaching methods for the delivery of cybersecurity content. 
in K-12 curriculum. And that's not an easy task. I spent some time with the Maryland State Department of Education group when they were reviewing the computer science curriculum. And we had to work hard to think about how to infuse cybersecurity concepts in what was being taught in the computer science arena. And so, and that was just in computer science. And we, I think we all know that uh, cybersecurity is multidisciplinary. So we probably need to infuse cybersecurity concepts in some of the other curricula that's out there. But it's not, it's not easy to um, kind of retrofit some of the cyber concepts into these courses. So we, we, you know, gen cyber camps are very, very useful for trying to do that. One of the um, things that they require, NSA requires, is that you follow that you follow their guidelines for the concepts that you teach. So on the right side of the screen, the concepts of think like an adversary, defense in depth, the CIA triad, and keeping it simple is basically what we had to follow. And I have a few slides that are talk about that in a little bit more detail. Next. So thinking like an adversary, of course, is trying to put yourself into the mindset of hackers and attackers. And, you know, we had to give examples of how we can uh, teach what, in order for student, uh, teachers and students to be able to think like an adversary, they have to know what some of the tools and techniques that the hackers use. So we taught some of those things that, so that they can start to um, maybe be a step ahead of our adversaries. Next, defense in depth is a major topic that has to be taught and it's basically you know, making sure that when you're building secure systems, secure software, that you're putting in multiple layers of security and not just one, one point of failure in a, in a nutshell. Confidentiality, uh, integrity, and availability are um, ma basic concepts of cybersecurity. So confidentiality, of course, is making sure that information is not um, disclosed or leaked. Anything that we, any systems that we're building, we make, need to make sure that they are secure from the standpoint of, the, of data security. Integrity, once again, the data has, uh, we have to ensure that it hasn't been modified or destroyed or um, been um, accessed by an unauthorized banner. And once again, we give some examples of what that might mean. Next is availability. And once again, that makes sure that information systems, computer systems are secure and accessible and usable, usable whenever they are needed. And once again, we have a few examples of those. I won't spend a lot of time with these because they are topics within themselves, but I just want to give you kind of a general idea of what some of the concepts are. I think we have one more. And keeping it simple. Um, simple designs, making sure that um, we're not putting in too many points of failure into any types of systems that we're building from a hardware or software standpoint. Too many points of failure give um, our adversaries more access points in order to uh, attack our systems. Those are the ma major principles and concepts that we had to cover in Gen Cyber, in the Gen Cyber camp. But this is just kind of a list of some of the topics that we went into in more detail. Uh, we talked about code cracking. Of course, we had to uh, have extensive discussions about cryptography. We had a hands-on um, hacker lab. And as Brandy mentioned, we had some uh, tools for them to use. Raspberry Pi is, is very popular in schools these days. And we gave the, the teacher participants not only a Raspberry Pi to have for their own testing and lab development, we also gave them uh, laptops. So uh, once again, it's a lot of, lot of um, information that we gave the, the teachers that uh, it, I actually felt it was overwhelming that we were giving them so much information, but at least we were covering some of the topics so that they knew, at least they had an idea of the topics and they had the supporting information if they had to dig deeper. 
Any, uh, did you guys want to say anything about that, Brandy and Nora? Um, no, I just, I, I think really you highlighted, it. it is a challenge, you know, but just sort of figuring out where to start and, and how much information to provide um, so as to give everyone a, 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 a starting place, but, but not to overwhelm them. And, and actually to have that physical experience with the labs, um, to be the student. You know, and to know what it's like, you know, okay, I've got this set of directions that I have to follow. I've never done this before. How am I going to problem solve? Did I do it right? Um, to have that experience and know that, okay, that's what my students are going to have to go through also. So I really appreciated that. And, and the importance of having things like labs and hands-on activities for the kids um, and not just, you know, getting up and lecture. I think one of the things I find with my class right now is I do minimal lecturing. Rather, I would um, format my class in a way where the kids have to investigate and find answers. And one of the best things um, that came out of it right now is the online labs. Um, I've recently just started using that. So we did um, Linux so the kids could go in and learn Linux commands and now we're doing Windows. So, and we got that through the, the Gen Cyber. And that was awesome. That's great. Okay, so that's kind of what the uh, program was about and how, what we were trying to get across. We're going to talk a little bit now about some of the challenges. So we can go to the next slide. So one of the challenges um, is that there's, you know, so many ways to define cybersecurity education. I, I kind of alluded to that when I was discussing the challenges that we had when we were implementing or infusing cybersecurity into computer sciences. But there's, you know, there's so many ways that people really think about cybersecurity education. And this is kind of a, a list of them. Um, you can have classes that target, you know, specific hardware or specific certifications. Um, you can ho have um, secure coding that can be integrated um, and come into some of integrated into some of the computer science classes, as I mentioned. Then on a non-technical side, you have people thinking about cybersecurity education from the ethics standpoint and the policy and the legal issues. Um, and we think about how they can be incorporated into um, social studies classes. Then you have back to some of the technical, the cloud computing and web development. A lot of middle school, a lot of schools are introducing how to build websites and things like that. So, uh, and of course, uh, students are very familiar with mobile apps. So all of those things can be introduced in uh, middle school. Uh, encryption and code breaking. We have content and labs and all kinds of things that you can use for teaching encryption and code breaking from, from kindergarten to high school. So um, there's quite a bit available for that. Uh, understanding how computers work and communicate, of course, that can that should start in elementary school. Children are using um, tablets and things like that. They should, you know, there are ways to teach them how those things actually work and are networked. Um, once again, on the non-technical side, start um, having students uh, understand. Um, their personal, personally identifiable information and how important it is for them to keep that secure. The whole issue about digital hygiene and citizenship is something that can start in the very early stages of K-12. I'm a strong believer that techno the technology vocabulary should, you know, be taught throughout uh, the K-12 through arena. P Children need to start understanding uh, the technology, the words that they hear, the things that are associated with cybersecurity. There's no, there's no reason why they can't have those as part of their readings and social studies, math, sciences, uh, so that as they start hearing more about cybersecurity careers, the lingo is not so foreign to them. And then, of course, we can start including cutting-edge uh, technologies like AI and uh, intelligent systems um, in, in the upper-level classes. So um, because there are so many ways to define cybersecurity education, I think that is one of the reasons it causes some of the challenges that we have. Next slide. 
So as I mentioned, um, Brandy, you want to talk about these challenges? Sure. Um, yeah, so there, there definitely are some challenges. Um, you know, at first, I, I think we've touched on this quite a bit, but it's, it's really just sorting out that curriculum because it, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that's taught as a standalone course or program. Um, obviously, you know, we're proponents for, you know, including cybersecurity, you know, wherever possible, but um, it is kind of figuring out where do these concepts apply in the curriculum you teach and, and how can you integrate them, um, whether that's in a computer science course or it's in a math course or, you know, um, as Lois mentioned in it, social sciences type of course, there's, there's a lot of different ways that cybersecurity can be integrated into the curriculum. So one of the challenges is trying to figure out where and what fits. Tweaking the curriculum for teacher comfort, I know that was something that, you know, was a little bit of a, a struggle for us because we had teachers coming in um, who had different backgrounds um, and were all kind of um, looking for different things. So it, it's kind of, you know, figuring out the group of teachers that you're working with and, and what are their interests and, you know, what are they looking for um, in support for teaching cyber. You know, so we try to, you know, pull these concepts from the NSA and, and figure out, you know, what would be most relevant for us to, to teach and, and how can we, you know, make those concepts hands-on and, and give them some real-world practice and also create um, things that they could take back to their own classrooms. Um, I think another challenge is just, you know, integrating that curriculum into various school districts. Everyone has a different structure, different states have different requirements. You know, Lois, you talked about Maryland and, and being on their um, computer science curriculum committee. Um, so that's a challenge in that everybody has sort of different requirements and goals. Professional development um, is a struggle. You know, I'm a former K-12. I was a teacher. I also worked in the, cell, uh, in the central office. Everybody is fighting for those professional development days that are embedded in the school year. Um, everybody wants to get in kind of their, their piece um, and so it, it can be difficult to carve out that time. Um, and teachers, you know, teachers have a, just a tremendous um, demands on them for their time. And, you know, they're, they're juggling a lot of different things at any one time. And, I, you know, I think Nora mentioned that, you know, it, when one of the reasons that we chose to have the camp in the summer is, is because we could get into that immersive experience because I think if we tried to do this in the middle of a school year, um, you all would have been like, no thanks, I'm good. Um, Cause there's just, there's a lot, there's a lot to do and a lot going on. So, you know, finding the time and the resources can be, can be tough. Integrating the curriculum into social studies, literacy and other areas. I think we're making progress there and in, in recognizing that the, the digital literacy is a skill that our students need, but we have a ways to go, certainly. So I'm sure there are many more challenges, but those were, were kind of some of the, the questions and the topics that we wrestled with, either planning, planning the camp or during the camp, you know, just talking with the teachers who were there um, about their struggles. I, I could add one more thing. I think you indirectly mentioned it is, um, well, with teacher professional development, but also just having teachers available to teach. Yeah. So I'm a computer science teacher, and um, one of the big issues is with the um, number of computer science classes and offerings going up is do we have the teachers to teach it? So where do we pull those from? Well, now here's another aspect of that, which is cybersecurity. So, like I mentioned, our school district just started this course this school year, and I got to go to Gen Cyber, and I got to work on and put all the curriculum in place for what we're teaching. But the other high school over here, they had 30 students signed up for cybersecurity, but they didn't have a teacher to teach it. Mm -hmm. um, 
So fortunately, one of their math teachers, he volunteered, never got to do any professional development. So I was like, okay, I will support you as much as I can. He's got a copy of my Google Classroom. He's got a copy of all the curriculum that I'm using, all the resources and whatnot. And I know he's too busy, you know, to bug me with questions and all that. Um, but I feel really bad because he was just, I mean, he's got a lot more students than I even have in my class. So again, you know, just one of those things is they're like getting the, the teachers and getting them the development that they need, of course. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, there's, there's a nationwide teacher shortage and it's especially bad in Maryland and especially in the STEM areas. Mm -hmm. So, um, Nora, tell me a little bit about getting the curriculum, getting the cybersecurity concepts into the curriculum. Is that a challenge? Um, and, and that's the one thing. Before I went to Gen Cyber, I was um, starting to poke around and try to find out, well, what high school um, curriculums are available? Um, there's a bunch out there. Um, like, different companies have uh, modules and whatnot. And I was, not too many of them were, like, year-long. Mm. I did find one um, that was more a uh, year long. Um, Derek Fab has uh, posted his. And going to the Gen Cyber Camp and having that introduction to the six cyber concepts and having the hands on with the labs was really good because it made me or helped me visualize what the curriculum should look like because I was just reading it, right? And I didn't know what it looked like in a classroom you guys showed me, well, this is what it looks like in the classroom. This is what it feels like. This is what the students are going to go through. And I actually like the idea of the uh, six cyber concepts um, to help me pull together um, the different units that the kids are teaching. So we were doing a unit on encryption. And at the end, I was like, okay, for your final project now, you guys go back and you pick one of the different concepts that we learned in encryption. And you tell me, well, how does this um, show uh, data integrity or how does this show um, privacy and the kids actually had fun and they did a really nice good nice job of it um, it's a couple of things that I would you know, be willing to share with um, other teachers as well exactly. um, I don't know if I answered your question but <laughs> yes yes uh, one, one other question for you mm -hmm. you go back to your districts or your school do you get the support from your leadership for the importance of cybersecurity into in the curriculum? Well, we, we knew, because we have a CS pathway. And I think, you know, you had talked about that before in Maryland, um, that cybersecurity is part of it. So we have um, four years, and three of them are computer science, and the fourth year, which is actually, if it, taken in order, cybersecurity would come like the second year. Because the third and fourth year would be advanced placement computer science. Um, and even though we have that pathway, though, we kind of like to also offer all these courses a la carte, which is what I like to do at my school. So I have kids in my class that have already taken AP computer science, but they saw it was being offered and they were interested, so they started to take it. Um, so I guess an answer to your question is um, yes. You know, coming from the supervisors is yes, we want to put this pathway into place, but we've got to find the curriculum. So they did support that. They supported me, obviously, going to the Gen Cyber Camp and having the extra time. I took a couple, quite a few hours during the summer as well, setting things up, getting ready for using um, Google Classroom and so that I could share that with the other teacher who was going to be teaching it as well. Uh, beyond that, as far as, like, for the general curriculum, so the general population of students, as you're mentioning it, in other courses, that's not there, but I think it needs to be. Like you're saying, you know, in social studies, um, maybe our media specialists, I know the media specialists would love to be able to teach the kids some cyber concepts. Um, they've even come to me and says, hey, can your students come and teach other students about, you know, online safety and things like that? Um, I don't think that's been addressed directly, and I think that's one area that should be addressed, especially K through eight. I only know about what we have in high school. I don't know that cybersecurity education has been even addressed K through eight. All right, All right. great. Um, thank you very much. Can you, you can go to the next slide. So um, we, we um, took this information from MCCE as to what would be uh, a win-win situation and most of these things are, are very 
foundational. You know, you just have to have some literacy and technology in uh, the vocabulary and the definition of cybersecurity. Of course, students need to have reasonable cyber, uh, reasonable computer skills. And I, I, I tend to think that that is happening um, because they have to use them for their um, lessons, for their reports and things like that. So I think uh, students are coming out with reasonable computer skills. Um, they talk also about at least one computer science class emphasizing problem solving and human computer interaction. That, it, that would be ideal. Also that um, the knowledge that there is a need for people in computer science and cybersecurity and the fact that there's, um, you know, interesting skills that come into play, there are high pay scales, there are all kinds of certifications that people can get, and there are all kinds of promotions and advancement opportunities. They need to have that knowledge. And just, I think, I think uh, Mark had a session on school counselors, I think, I can't remember. But one of the things that I've seen in, in my travels in cybersecurity is that many people are getting school counselors involved with understanding what some of the cybersecurity careers are so that they can uh, impart that knowledge to students. I keep hearing that if a student doesn't know about a particular field, they're not going to aspire to that. So um, one way to get that information to them is definitely through the school counselors. And number five, um, one, that, that tends to make me think about getting more women in cybersecurity because I think some of them have an attitude that cybersecurity and sometimes uh, computer science is, is boring and it's not challenging and it's not interesting. Uh, and we need to change that attitude to make sure that uh, students know that it is challenging and it is interesting work. And we can do that by some of the things that Nora is saying making some of these um, cybersecurity type lessons fun in class. And I think that grabs their attention quite a bit. And like I said, counseling um, supports students and thinking about cybersecurity careers. Okay, next. So what we can do next, um, and Nora and Brandy, please feel free to jump in with these because you, you guys have more of that the uh, practical knowledge about these things, but I'll just kind of talk briefly about them. You can, we can, of course, help identify quality curriculum and professional development op opportunities. We've kind of talked about that already. My, my concern with the Gen Cyber Camp was that we gave the teachers so much information that if I were one of them, I might have had a difficult time sorting through what I could use in my classes. So I think that we need to make sure, even though it's um, quality curriculum, we have to make sure that it, it is able to fit within the courses that they teach. I think Maryland is, is uh, maybe ahead of the game because of the stance that we have about cybersecurity and the importance in the state. So I think working with the districts to develop plans to integrate cybersecurity is we might be a little bit ahead of some of the other states or um, di or uh, municipalities. So I think that that's something that's kind of ongoing from what my experience is and my traverses through cybersecurity, cybersecurity world. I think I am seeing uh, a lot more energy as far as being able to integrate cybersecurity for uh, all students. We need to identify and fix gaps that uh, between what's being taught and what needs to be taught. That kind of talks about the quality curriculum a bit. We, uh, we also have to find ways to scale, sustain, broaden participation. And um, I think MCCE, I think it was them, who really did a great job in, or, or one of the, it was one of the Gen Cyber camps did a great job in, in focusing on Gen Cyber, but it was also uh, focusing on um, students with disabilities. So they were actually making sure that we were, you know, touching all bases as far as the socioeconomic um, arena, the disabilities arena, gender, ethnic, and racial diversity. All of that's happening within the Gen Cyber community because in addition to having a camp for a teacher or students, 
you can actually focus on gender or ethnicity or disabilities. You, you can really hone in on hitting some of those um, lesser served communities. And the others are just kind of general. I didn't know if you guys had anything that you wanted to add to what we can do next. I, I think one of the things that I would add, and this speaks um, really directly to something you said earlier, Nora, and, and I think that's helping um, our, our teachers who are teaching these cybersecurity concepts um, network with each other because I think often I don't want to say they work in isolation, but I would guess oh, sure. one of few teachers in your school that's teaching it. You mentioned there's someone else and he's the only teacher and, and really his background is math. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not like the other content areas where, you know, you can talk with your colleagues, you know, about these various curriculum issues. You may be the only teacher in your school teaching cybersecurity. And so I think finding ways, you know, whether it's a gen cyber camp or, or some other platform for these teachers to connect with each other and, and be supports for each other and just to have an opportunity to, to talk about these things is helpful. It is, it is. Um, as a matter of fact, um, that's one of the things, um, social networks, um, on Facebook, there's a group for cybersecurity educators that's been very helpful. Also, um, I also know unit contest. Just as far as um, knowing about the contest, um, that's one way. I mean, I was a uh, cyber patriot coach long before I ever thought that I would be teaching um, cybersecurity class. And I think that helped raise awareness with the students so that when we did finally actually offer the class that I've got kids coming in, it's like, well, I did it over here. It sounds looks interesting. So let me try this. A couple of years ago, I don't think very many of our, my students would even mention cybersecurity as an interest in college or as a career. So the combination of things, also just the fact that, you know, if you build it, they will come offering the class kind of makes it aware to the kids like, oh, this is an opportunity um, to do that. Um, and I like that you mentioned the one bullet is about um, the resources. I think that might be one of the things that's missing um, is just, is there one place where I can go and you know, pick and choose, like what is available. One, this, there's a word for it, and it's escaping me right now. Because I know, like I'm also working in um, introducing more artificial intelligence in my computer science classes. And they have, I believe it's like a, a GitHub site of like, well, here are all the current things that are available that you can use. Like a repository. Kind Thank of. you, that's the word. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, yeah, a repository of sources would be, would be awesome. Very helpful. Well, um, we actually, uh, I was in a meeting with Greg. I don't know if Greg is on the phone, but um, there was some talk about, you know, from a statewide standpoint, to think yes. about pulling together some of the uh, many, many resources. That, that was part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. There's so much out there. There are individual repositories now that have quite a bit. Of information, I even count my Gen Cyber repository as a, a pretty extensive. But there's a lot that's out there now, and um, it's kind of difficult to aggregate all of that stuff so that it's easily accessible. So um, yeah, that's 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 a really important point. Mm -hmm. The last one on here says obtain resources, and I needed. I just wanted to say that. It w it's a good idea for schools, uh, individual schools or school districts to, you know, um, partner with some of the universities that are available who can tap into some of the grant funding that's available from uh, the federal government. There, I, as a Center for Academic Excellence at UMGC, many things come across our desks that talk about opportunities for grants. So they're, they're, from a cybersecurity standpoint, there are lots of resources out there. It's just a matter of you know, partnering with the right people, either community colleges or four-year institutions, um, and, and seeing what types of um, funding that you can get uh, made available to the schools to help with the cybersecurity demands. So. Because teaching cybersecurity, there, there's a lot of considerations that we put in place because of all the firewalls and all the restrictions that are put on student computers. 
I'm fortunate that because I teach or because I coach a cyber patriot that I have a virtual machine software on the computers in my lab so that I can also use it in my class. But in the other high schools in the district, they don't have that. So that's something we still have to figure out. And being able to not get to be able to run some simulations or do things like that just because of the restrictions. Right. And, and I should put in a plug at this point, since, since this is being recorded, that UMGC does have a current grant with NSA to provide a product called Net Labs to um, teachers and um, students. Net Labs is basically a virtual learning platform. Um, it, it's a virtual lab platform, I should say, with many, many tools in it that teach uh, teach towards some of the certifications like Security Plus and Cisco and Network Plus, A Plus, all of the CompTIA certifications. So there, there's a whole host of uh, opportunities for teachers from a professional development standpoint to get access to that, to that, uh, to those labs, and to also to think about how to use those labs as curriculum in their classes. So, um, and that's all free of charge right now. And if anyone is interested, if any teachers are interested, just send an email to netlabs at umgc.edu. That was a shameless plug. And, well, I can vouch. That's what we're using right now. Good. Mm -hmm. So Mark, I think uh, the next slide, I think it's just questions. If anyone has any questions or if they needed more information, they could always reach us. Some of the stuff where you're asking about resources, mentors, extra teachers, trying to get teachers educated or wanting to do this stuff. Have you talked with the Cyber Maryland Foundation? To try the to Cyber help? Maryland Foundation. Yeah, so they're, they're, here we have Cyber Texas. Maryland has Cyber Maryland. There's a Cyber USA organization that runs all this stuff. Now, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, we're definitely plugged into Cyber Maryland. In fact, we've been to several of their events and stuff like that, too. Yes, yeah, so, uh, from a UMGC standpoint, not this past year, but the previous two years, UMGC was the educational um, track sponsor at, okay. at Cyber Maryland. And we um, had a whole day of, uh, I think, one, one year we focused on CISOs, what CISOs what keeps CISOs awake at night, and I can't remember the other one, but we've been very much tuned into Cyber Maryland um, and also Cyber USA. Okay, because here in, well, San Antonio specifically, Cyber Texas plays a huge role, not only with the Cyber Patriot competition and everything else here, but some, you know, with the NSA bringing in the Gen Cyber Camps down here, uh, they have anything cyber, they have their fingers in. Right. So. Whenever they ask for resources, if they can't find them from me, uh, they'll ping someone else that is in tune with the organization. So whether that's me going out to the schools talking, whether that's me coaching the teams I coach, uh, whether it's me teaching the senior citizens, or if I know someone, I tell them to contact Cyber Texas cool. as a main focal point for everything. Yeah. So can I ask a quick, you brought up a topic that we didn't talk about, and that those are the competitions. And, mm -hmm. you know, I know Nora does some of that. And I went to a robotics competition for my grandson over the weekend. It was fascinating. It yes. was totally fascinating. Uh, it wasn't so much cyber, but it was engineering and robotics. But, you know, anybody's thoughts about bearing in, in teaching cybersecurity to K-12? So Cyber Patriot season for us here, for my teams, is done. So now we're moving into the National Cyber League, where we're getting into that next step of progressing their cyber knowledge. So Cyber, cyber Patriot builds that foundational knowledge network, how to harden the system, how to find bugs within the system. National Cyber League is actually going out and doing the pen testing, searching for the flags, actually learning a more and building on everything they have. And their enrollment has just started up. Right. And it, it also runs along with the PICO CTF that starts again in September, I believe. But you can play their competition year-round. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all we have, Mark, I believe. 
Okay, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, uh, Lois, you leading this group and, and doing our very first uh, Teach the Teacher. Uh, be happy to have feedback from those who are on the, on the call so we can continue to make this better. I know the timing is, is really kind of an interesting um, uh, challenge on, on when best to, to have these sessions and get the most teachers possible. So your thoughts on that are most appreciated as well. Uh, it is going to be uh, posted uh, later on after Nefris does their great job as usual on cleaning up the video. Uh, so we really appreciate everybody's attending. If no one has any more questions, um, I think we'll end our session for the day. Well, I just want to thank Nora and Brandy. They have been so supportive to the whole project, and um, you know I really appreciate appreciate them so much. Okay, thanks for everyone for dialing in. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Have a great day. Bye bye. Okay, have a great day. Thank you.